Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Is this uh, thing on? <laughs> My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Michael. And Michael, what's uh, did the show start? What's what's happening? Right uh, here? I think I think the beginning of my my little cute intro there might have gotten cut off. It looks yeah, I'm like pretty looking. sure I'm pretty sure that got cut. I'm actually looking into the future right now, <laughs> and uh, oh Jesus! So your name is Eric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still Eric, and you're Michael. And there's movies on the uh, yeah. on the show. Um, you can use the chapters that are embedded in the feed uh-huh. to skip yeah. to the other films. If you don't understand how to use chapters, just to kind of collect some data here, do a little data mining, send us an email, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, and one of us, me, will personally explain to you how chapters work. Sure. Well, maybe explain the problem you're having with chapters. Yeah. No, so if you don't get chapters, we'd actually like to know, because... After four long years, I'm starting to feel like this intro is a little redundant. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, speaking of intros, Chapters, what are the movies spoilers. we're spoiling? Well, I, I think we talked about last week, we're going to do two uh, documentaries of questionable integrity. So those two documentaries will be Exit Through the Gift Shop and The Last Exorcism. Uh, one I believe and one I don't. Actually, uh-huh. I don't know. That is, that's correct, but that's in the reverse order. I think. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm already confused. You know what? How about we cover that in the individual films? All right. We're going to start with Exit Through the Gift Shop, otherwise known as the Banksy film. Right. It's so, a misnomer right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is, isn't it? Um, how much would you say you knew about Banksy going into this? Oh, my God. Um, instead, I, I can't put a number on it, but what I can say I did know was English, graffiti artist. There you go. Dark did intro for The Simpsons. Oh, sure, yeah. That's it. That's really all I knew. I didn't know any... I had seen his art, but it, nothing stuck in my brain. I guess I think I knew the rat thing was part of his yeah, yeah, yeah. His deal. I'd seen a little bit of Banksy stuff, and I still don't know anything about street art. But uh, Exit Through the Gift Shop does this amazing thing where it acts as the perfect introduction to street art, but then it also functions on this higher level. Sure. And so I want to talk about it a little bit as that intro to street art first before yeah. we get into the where it transcends from great to fucking brilliant. Yeah. Uh, because there's definitely a point at which it does that. So right away, I'm feeling like it's French heist time again, like we're doing Man on Wire uh-huh. all over again. Yeah. Now, this is the French in America, or right. a French man. A Frenchman in America. In, uh, in America, discovering street art, and we're going to discover it along with him. Yeah. A perfect setup. Yeah. Do you get an idea by the time you kind of reach the end that you have some notion of what street art is or how it oh, works? Or Yeah. Well, by the end, I, I don't know. I won't say. I can't say. I've seen the film. I know how it ends. Sure. So I can't say that I know what street art is just okay. by following the <laughs> sure. former plot of the film. What I can say is I'm into street art. Yeah. And I want to do street art. Oh, I think everybody comes away but thinking that same thing. I have no idea what fluid they have on their brooms while they're sweeping sure, things on the sure, wall that makes yeah. it stick i have no idea what makes things cool and what makes things lame i understand sure. that it probably has to be black and white that's something i learned right right um and that you have to do it quick and you have to do it high yeah altitude wise altitude wise high um, sure but honestly i don't know shit about street art other than it's awesome it's Google really could probably cool. uh probably show you yeah but also if you just try double and, google show if you try com. and make out with a street artist for literally months of your life you you may learn the chemical composition of street art saliva you know i'd like to think that i gained something from that traumatic experience perhaps a demon uh the other place you could just go is kinkos because apparently that's all you need to do (laughs) um kinkos is god you know when i think about the legality of street art and we could do a whole fucking show as libertarians and artists on legality and street art how do you feel about it Mm mm-hmm um, it's, I mean, that conversation kind of has itself, so I feel like it's pointless for us to do so. But when you start to think about, as you're watching the movie, you're thinking about the legality. Some people's faces are blurred. Some people are famous. Banksy is one of the, the biggest names and sure. he lives in anonymity. And the second biggest name who I won't name lives in non-anonymity and got his spotlight in the fucking movie. Yeah. All right. It was Shepard. You saw the movie. You know who it is. <laughs> if you didn't see the movie, you don't know who it is. It's Shepard. 
So as much as Terry might be an alibi in what they're doing, there's that uh, that line you cross of you know creating the documentary and creating the contents of sure. the documentary, right. you know, impacting your subject matter. But I mean, I think these guys are just as much alibis to their cohorts as Kinkos is an alibi. You know, <laughs> I mean, one participant might be more willing than the other, but Terry, at least in the beginning, is facilitating. Yeah. When I did, I know I mentioned a couple times, especially around when that bootleg came out, but I did some stuff for the Birthday Massacre, and um, we set up this site, which was called uh, TBM Chicago. The idea was it was a Canadian band. We wanted to create a presence in the United States, uh, this girl Andy and I, so that they would come to the United States and play shows. Sure. And it worked. Yes, it did. And we did this mostly using Kinkos, and we would create stencils, and we'd create little sticker things. And we would put them up at malls and whatever. I, I don't know if it had any impact on helping right. promote the band. But uh, Kinkos was actually amazing and perfect. for You would be astonished the kinds of crazy things you could have made at Kinkos for <laughs> um, legally dubious artistic and promotional purposes. Uh-huh. Thanks, Kinkos. So we start to get a lot of the ideas of what these uh, different pieces of street art mean. And that's, you know, that's where it feels the coolest to me. Um, the Space Invader stuff is great right away because it's just a, it's highly accessible. You don't have to think about it too much. It's kind of poppy. But we get into that obey idea, and that's the first time we get a really layered idea that right. I like a lot. Um, real power from perceived power. Yeah, exactly. That's brilliant. I love that. It's so hard to do documentaries on this show because we're always divided between talking about how the documentary was done mm-hmm. and the ideas in the documentary. Right. And so they spell that stuff out pretty well, and I don't want to go over it too much, but just the idea that you create this obey thing just to create it. Sure. Well, he said it was an inside joke, right? Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't explain the joke, which is even better. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Yeah, and then it it becomes widespread, and people ask about it, so that helps spread it more. It's the perception of power, giving something that had no power, real power. That's fantastic. And it's an early look into what we're going to get a little bit later, Mm -hmm. I think on a much smaller scale. It's what kind of ends up ballooning in that same sort of meta way, that same self-commentary or self-fulfilling way that Obey does. Now, Terry, our filmmaker, Mm -hmm. or at least our perceived uh, filmmaker, is on a hunt for Banksy. And uh, Well, eventually he's on a hunt for Banksy. Sure. At first he's just on a hunt for something to film. Yeah, and he finds some people to film, and then he starts a collection, and he starts to get all these tapes. He loves a very specific piece of filmmaking, which is capturing things on film. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like cataloging it. He doesn't like uh, batch importing it. He does not like editing it. He really has no interest in a final product. Not a big fan of rendering. You know, he (laughs) rendering. I don't even remember what that is. (laughs) No, I mean, this guy does not care about the final product so much as the adventure. But he does, and I believe, uh, because I'm like that myself, he wants to capture these moments on film just to know they're there because they're going to go away at some point. And the street artists, I mean, that idea appeals to all of them, maybe specifically because this medium, unlike almost any other artistic medium, disappears nearly overnight. Right. You know, there's there's stuff just in the time that we have planned to do this on the show and are recording right now that things have shown up outside the studio in Uptown where we're at yeah. and have disappeared. Right. Well, so, because it's an illegal medium. Yeah. Essentially. Well, yeah. And depending on your materials, you know, it wears over time or you do it in a place that's temporary. There was right. some construction over here where there was some great street art and it disappeared because they took the boards and stuff down. Uh-huh. So yeah, it's very temporary. And so he wants to capture that. And as he gets this collection, he's missing Banksy. So when he gets Banksy, this is really the point where if this documentary wasn't already kind of cool, the fact that Banksy is in it, no one's ever had this look at him before, this kind of exclusive access, barely even in print, let alone on video. Right. And so that makes this an important piece of, it makes it a historical piece of film Mm -hmm. right there. Just seeing if it were nothing more than Banksy assembling the rat stencil, that would be enough just right. to go, this is the only, it's, it's fucking Bigfoot footage at mm-hmm. that point. You know yeah. what I mean? It's the only Banksy we have captured on tape. But then he gets to see inside Banksy's studio. Right. Well, he gets to see inside Banksy's life. Banksy comes out and says, well, he kind of became a friend. Yeah. Yeah. That's this gold mine moment. Sure. In the it movie really is. Too, because you have this enigma of an icon in, mm-hmm. I mean, he is the name when it yeah. comes to street art. Absolutely. And then you get the admission that now your lead, the person who's running the film you're watching, or so you believe, yeah. 
is now in the inner circle with Banksy yeah. all because of his unrestricted access with his Disneyland stunt. Oh my God. Well, the Disneyland one's the the best, but that's when they're starting the installation. So sure. you get that. So you get that behind the scenes, look at the installation, but man, even that few seconds of footage of his studio, you know, that's Bigfoot was such a good comparison because you could literally mine over that footage for days you could spend hours, maybe days, combing through, sure. trying to look at every piece of, you know, every material he uses. This is the fucking Picasso of graffiti art. Mm-hmm. This guy uh, popularized it, at least in the United States, and still has some of the most prolific work in that medium. Right. So you want to know, and it's a secretive medium, and he's anonymous. I mean, you everything is a clue. Right. You know what I mean? Every last little detail you have uh, people, I'm sure, you know, fucking body language experts going over this right. and trying to say, well, what do we know about? Now we know what his hands look like. You know, we know what method he's using. We know these little things. But then there's these other great pieces of art you would never see. Things like the the forged money. Right. That yeah. you would just never know about. Right. Mill- what did he say? Millions of pounds or whatever. Right. In forged uh, bills yeah. that are just sitting on a shelf. Because they weren't intending to counterfeit. Sure, yeah. They were just intending to, they were making a statement. They were making a piece of art. But apparently in England, they weren't paying close enough attention sure. to the notes. And essentially it turned out that they had made a million pounds in counterfeit money. And that's, I mean, that's prison time. Yeah. When you start messing around with guerrilla art like that, you just naturally, I mean, the art folds onto itself. Right. You know, you intend to just make a, a bill, a fucking note, and right. people look at it and kind of think, oh, what's... This is know, wrong. Yeah. This isn't what I thought <laughs> this it is was. wrong. And maybe, maybe if you're lucky, what does this mean? Why right. did someone do this? But then when people start counterfeiting or using it, I mean, really accidentally yeah. to buy things, you've created this uh, this whole thing that you didn't even intend you found out this whole thing well it's just another example of the implied power it's sure. the fact that people are using it as currency and no one's paying close enough attention that makes it a crime it's not a crime by necessity sure. it's a crime in practice yeah and then it becomes a largely accidental crime right, exactly. as well which makes you think about things like crime law and you know the uh, the where, physicality of our currency right and, and then where the responsibility is sure, drawn sure <laughs> is it kinko's fault yeah you know, that kind of thing I'm sure they didn't make those at Kinko's, but the rules there are a little more strict, although I don't know overseas. I really don't know. One of the things that this documentary conveys really well is the tension you feel from this kind of illegal art. Sure. I feel tense every time I see anybody posting anything. In the, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, especially if a squad car comes by or whatever, but just once they go out at night and having been in a couple of those situations myself, it just seems There's like... This, even Even if you're not doing anything wrong. Yeah. I mean, I went to school for two years down in like downtown in the loop sure. in, in Chicago. And if you're out after say 2 a.m., you know, I was 20 less. Mm. I was younger than 20 walking around on the street with a bunch of other younger than 20 year olds. Squad cars pull up. Yeah. Sure. And without fail, someone's initial reaction was to just fucking yeah. bolt. Yeah, definitely. And so Im- imagine that feeling heightened to you're sure. actually committing a crime. Yeah, right. Well, and even if you're just making stuff, yeah. you know, anytime you're filming anything, I can never go out and film, just film things in public. It feels, it, it, it doesn't feel like you're wrong, but it feels like everyone else sure. thinks you're committing <laughs> yeah. a crime. Well, and that was the great thing about Terry is he got so used to that and they started talking about, you know, the artists that he surrounded himself with got so used to him filming, that's when they eased up. Sure. I really like candid photography and I really like capturing things in their element. And that's hard to do because you take out a camera and that reality has gone. Yeah. You know, we've talked about that with all sorts of documentaries and things we've done. As soon as you turn on a camera, that is no longer reality. That was once again, uh, the movie, mm-hmm. Michael Moore hates America, something that who would have known how many great fucking ideas came out of right. that documentary, but you turn on the camera and it's no longer reality. That one you mentioned at Disneyland. Yeah. Something about the security there and just seeing him posted and the music's a little tense. And then the interrogation. I mean, you yeah. know these guys get out fine. Sure. But you don't fuck with the Disney machine. I know. I, mean, I know you really they, don't. They brought don't fuck with the a mouse. very dark political message into a place that is, I'm pretty sure, contractually obligated to be the happiest place yeah, on Earth. Yeah, right, right. But I love that they go there. I love they don't tell anyone. And yeah. I think it's great that when that inspiration strikes them, I mean, that's how a good artist does it. They go, oh, I'm inspired. I'm going to go do that right now. I don't care about my installation. 
we would get so much more shit done if that yeah. was the case with either of us. You manage to have songs and things. You yeah. get things done. <laughs> it's just so much easier to go, oh, I'm really kind of busy with this thing right yeah. now. You know, I'm feeling it, but I'm kind of busy. And I think he probably knew that too. And he said, the time is right right now. All this stuff is going on politically. I'm feeling inspired. Let's take a break. Let's go do this. And they go out and they do it. And maybe they're not as careful as they should be. And they almost get caught. And that makes it more exciting. Mm -hmm. Another really bizarre thing about this medium is since it's uh, in a gray area legally, I mean, really, it's in a red area legally. Once you become world famous, you become the most successful person at it. How the fuck do you monetize that? Yeah. That's uh, every artist's dream. It's never about the money, right? But if you didn't have to work, man, that sure be nice. If my art supported me, then I could spend more time on sure, the art. Yeah. Well, and it's great when you get paid for shows and stuff, sure. right? I yeah, mean, that I mean, always feels good. It's never it's never a situation where I would abhor being handed cash for my art. Sure, sure. Yeah, the uh, monetizing things like that is an art form in itself. Yeah. You know, we see that now with the, the digital music landscape and movies. And you and I were just talking about that thing Louis C.K. did a while ago, selling his own right. stand-up thing yeah. for five bucks or whatever. Uh, these guys, a lot of the, the forefront of the digital revolution is people already have names. The uh, Trent Reznors of mm -hmm. the world. People are already well known. But once you pop into the spotlight, you can't just, you're anonymous. You can't just show up. and Most of the time. But, you know, you come up with these clever ways. You do an art show and you sell art. And maybe, you know, you, you rub off on other people. Then there's that moment with Terry. The great moment where, you know... It's it's hard to describe having not been in that situation, but you've had that moment of showing your hand with people where, you know, you it, it's time to put your cards on the table. You yeah. show your poker hand and sure. you have nothing. Yeah. And with Terry, it's the moment where he shows his poker hand and he's actually playing Uno when everyone right. else is playing yeah, poker. Exactly. You know what I mean? Well, first he, I mean, the first thing right off the bat is when he goes, here's the documentary I've been making. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's, yeah. you want to talk about cards on the table. <laughs> that's really it. It's just shit. But that's just, that's the tip of how clueless Terry really is. Well, Banksy says it so well. He says, you know, it was at that point I realized Terry maybe wasn't uh, so much a filmmaker, but maybe a mental person with a camera. Yeah. You know, it's like talking to somebody about music every day for months and you guys decide to jam, you show up, and the other guy doesn't know how to form a chord. Sure. Well, the other guy shows up with an accordion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, that could be it, too. An accordion might take more skill. I don't know. You ever played an accordion? No, but neither have they. And so this is that final point. This is up to now. There has been these great moments in this documentary that make it an increasingly better, more historical, and more important landmark right. in this medium uh, and, and for everything that's happened to graffiti art. But then... It transcends, as graffiti art itself often does, from great to astonishing. Right. <laughs> to, you know, it goes from being an important piece in that medium sure. to really validating itself in other mediums. Right. It, it holds up the entire art form as saying, here's why this is important. Not only are we going to make something great about street art, but we're going to give you an example of why street art in itself is a, an important new thing. Right. And it only works by its own success. If it does. By it does. the last third of the movie, when Mr. Brainwash comes out, if you don't get street art, you don't realize that he sucks. Sure, sure. Well, but that's the it. the fact that you have been brought up on street art at this point, you get it. You know, somehow, intrinsically, you know what's good street yeah, art. Yeah, you and do. And you know his is <laughs> bad. Well, isn't that amazing? You know, it's this... Uh, we were talking about Carl Pilkington a yeah, ton it's dead on, on the Cemetery Junction show. Fucking dead on. I mean, that's part of the accessibility that people don't realize. You don't have to know street art or really even be interested in it. This is just an experiment in learning something you have no idea about and then knowing it better than the guy the movie is about. Right. Then suddenly using this collection of knowledge, you have uh, it teaches you. It brings you in. It creates an inside joke for you. And then you use what you learn to enjoy someone else's ignorance. Right. And this, the best part is that he's a documentarian of street art. Right. He has 10 years on you and I. Yeah. And he doesn't fucking. How could you not get it? Well, I think I think that it, it gets even fucking funnier when it boomerangs back and sure. he makes a million dollars. <laughs> sure. Oh, no, I know. Well, that's the, the commentary part. Right. So this starts to answer questions, not just about street art, but about modern art. Sure. These uh, questions people always have um, if you detest modern art or you're new to modern art. 
uh, contemporary kind of art where you walk into the gallery and you see a toilet turned on its side. Yeah, whatever stupid installation or installation that you just don't agree with or don't get. And you're mad that, oh, that's not art. Right. How could this be considered art? You don't even take a second to ask what what does it mean? Or maybe you do. And maybe it's not art. Maybe all modern art is, I was going to say rubbish, but let's not go there. Oh, Damon, you sneak your way into (laughs) all of our shows. It kind of brings up this question. At this point, the audience, they may not know what art is, but they know what isn't art. Yeah. You know, you you walk into that gallery and you could point to things and go, oh, I see what they're trying to do there. And that is definitively the wrong thing to do. Well, I mean, don't be cruel. Right off the bat, mm-hmm. the the fir- that's the first thing you see of Mr. Brainwash. That's sure. before you know he's Mr. Brainwash. Yeah, right, right. And it's just Elvis, but they they replaced a guitar with a little play school gun. Oh, man. And then it's called Don't Be Cruel. Yeah, and you know, this says something about genius, too. Because having been around Banksy, knowing the little that I do about Banksy, I might look at that piece without knowing anything about it and go, oh, that's Banksy. Right. Because this guy has been around him so much just by osmosis. He's getting some of the sure. icons and some of the imagery, well, the juxtaposition of these different things. You you start to realize that he doesn't have a creative force. No, he doesn't. There, Terry doesn't have a creative force at all. He's a documentarian. He's got the camera on. He basically has just been copying other people. Yeah. Literally, he's yeah. copying them onto film. Sure. And then that translates directly into his art form. He's yeah. just doing what he's seen the best of the best do. Yeah, and you start to realize when there's nothing behind that. Because otherwise, it doesn't matter. He's making art, and it's similar to Banksy, and maybe it's not original, but it's still good. But if there's nothing behind it, that's when it's terrible. Sure. When you start to see that he's creating this art in mass on a conveyor belt right. by hiring people off a of fucking yeah. Craigslist or whatever, uh-huh. that's when you know, first of all, he's farming out his bad art, and secondly, it's terrible art. And then when you ask him to explain it or to talk about it, some artists take the approach... And, you know, I, I barely ever made anything interesting enough for anyone to ask me about, but obviously I have a show on the internet and I love talking so much. I'm not the type of person who's quiet about things they make. Right. But a lot of artists take the approach where they just don't talk about their stuff. Yeah, that's what I do most They're, of the time. Yeah, right. And that's a great approach because <laughs> then if you don't know what the fuck you're doing sure. or you haven't even figured it out yourself yet, nobody knows. Yeah. But he is like I am. He loves talking about stuff. And uh, he may be the only person who makes crappier art than I do. He just has no concept of what, well, you see, it's Elvis, but uh, instead of holding the guitar, like, like Elvis would, he's got a toy. It's a toy gun, says Fisher Price. <sighs> this is a soup can. I repeat it a lot. Yeah. Life is beautiful. Oh, Jesus. It's terrible. But then you're right. It's once again, folding in on itself. It's a commentary on artistic interpretation mm-hmm. too. He makes a million dollars in his opening. People go nuts over this stuff. You know, and a couple of people do get it. There is a a glimpse of hope. There's one guy who says, you know what? I see a lot of the same stuff here. He's exhausting the simple formula he's built, but maybe that kind of says something as a collection about pop and celebrity, which is true. You know, it Mm -hmm. might say something about those things. Uh, Certainly, again, in that Carl Pilkington way, the existence of this man has said a lot of profound things in the art world, but his work is crap. And some people realize that. Not a lot of people realize that. Mm -hmm. From what I've read, his smaller collections and shows that weren't, you know, as highly celebrated with that kind of publicity and celebrity around them haven't done as well. So maybe people in the art world do get that. Maybe they don't. But it also uh, speaks to how people read their own art into someone else's. Sure. Which is something that you and I now do for a fucking living on this show is look at any movie and find things in it, even things that let's be honest, sometimes aren't there, Yep. you know, but that's not the point. The point is to have conversations and bring those things up and find anything we can find, Yeah. contribute anything we can. And so that's what we're doing here is we're looking at his pieces and trying to figure out, I mean, some of his stuff is so bad, you can't even have that conversation. Yeah, it's true. Not even if you want to. So the one thing that I found very powerful about the way the story is told is Mm -hmm. at the beginning, Terry, you were just absolutely... You adore him. He's yeah. this cute little guy. Sure. He's really endearing. I mean, likening him again to um, our man Philippe. on wire here. Man on yeah, wire, Philippe. yeah. You feel for him. You're happy for him. 
he's loving it. You're loving it. He loves that you're loving it. Yeah. Everybody's having a good time. And then he sells the fuck out and you just want (laughs) him to go away. Yeah. You want nothing to do with him. You watch him spray painting life is beautiful on the wall and it shows you from the side. It's really coy about what's he doing? What's he making? And the whole time I'm sitting there going, you're making shit. Stop. Everybody knows whatever you're doing is stupid. Well, yeah, that's the, uh, you know, you and I, and my voice is already (laughs) starting to go on this show. You and I have been talking a lot, uh, in between having seen this movie and then doing the show just right. because it's brought up so many ideas and there's so much to chew on even before we started recording but i kind of liken that to scarface yeah. or any kind of you know the rise and fall of story seeing someone go from nothing to a big grand whatever and there is uh key moments in uh, you know to consider him as having a character arc of it's almost classic the kind of character arc he might have right of coming up among the greats and then getting this delusion of greatness himself sure. of these different moments where you know he's injured for his art he suffers for his well, art he, and he's almost created by the people who actually know what they're doing shepherd and banksy both endorse him right sure sure both begrudgingly sure but yeah. they still do and at the end of the day they both just realize they've they kind of hate themselves utter for monster it. it's mm-hmm. ba- it's you know it's frankenstein yeah yeah, you know, and I wonder about that, too. Uh, in the same way when we talked about um, uh, Catfish, that was one of the things we brought up. Catfish is another documentary, and it's so good. Some people don't even believe it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember bringing up, I don't even know if this made air, but uh, Prankumentaries, um, what a lot of people are referring to this kind of class of documentary as. Uh, I'm Still Here, or whatever, came out kind of sure. around the same time. There was a lot of this stuff. Some of it obviously hoaxed, some of it just so good people questioned it. And I don't know if it was something about that particular time when this came out that people were just highly doubting of what was being presented to them, which is great that there was an era for that. I guess that's good. But there are people who think that this character is so pitch perfect that it was a creation of Banksy's in the same way that people doubted Carl Pilkington was real and thought that Ricky Gervais made him up. Does any part of your mind go there? I no. mean, I know you're kind of like myself and being just a, you accept people at their, I at see their word, no, but... I see no evidence to see. That's what I fall back on. Right. Make that assumption. I mean, it's, it's a romantic notion that yeah. Banksy created this amazing public installation, a human installation yeah. that going back to the shape of things. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, and a great comment on the medium and a way to bring this, uh, you know, to, create some sort of story arc to bring this to the public. Yeah, but I see no reason to force that conclusion just because it's romantic. Sure. Yeah, I fall in the, the same way. I will, uh, I will believe what people say at face value. I will, of course, take evidence into consideration, and I will raise an eyebrow at just about anything. But unless I have a specific reason to doubt someone's claim or some kind of evidence, then, you know, the humanistic side of me, I mean, when there's literally no reason for me to accept or deny a claim then I usually just default on, okay, well, I, I hear what you're saying and I'll take it with a grain of salt, sure. but that's probably how it's going until I find reason to believe otherwise. Unless they feed you right off the bat that they're a total clown and they're just milking it for <laughs> the betterment of, uh, I guess, society. I think you're talking about the last exorcism. I, yeah, that's it. That's what I was getting at there. Before you transition oh, gracefully sorry. into the last <laughs> exorcism. You're too smooth at this for your own good. Uh, (laughs) The only thing I was going to say is that now that we've had some time to kind of check back in on this stuff after the movies come out, Mr. Brainwash is still actively doing things. Yeah. He's worked with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He did that Madonna cover. I mean, he did stuff far after the the movie came out, or as far as I guess he could. It seems like it would be a lot of upkeep for Banksy. I really, like you do, I think that's a romantic idea, but the evidence seems to suggest that Banksy just landed on a pot of gold yep. or knew how to weave an incredible story out of, of what what could have otherwise been a fucking disaster right. in his career and his life. So you want to talk about the the last exorcism and you want to talk about Reverend Marcus. Where would you start there? I think you start when you're talking, and this is weird, and I know this is going to freak you out even though you've seen the movie. But I want to talk about The Exorcist, Cotton Marcus, as an honest man. I think the most important notion of Cotton Marcus is that he wants the best. Yeah. He goes about it the way we disagree. He's a very ends, justifies the means motherfucker. Sure. Um, But he's honest. He comes right out of the gate saying he doesn't buy it. He comes right out of the gate saying that his dad 
groomed him to sure. being a child preacher. Sure. I mean, he's the pen and teller of exorcism. <laughs> sure. Well, he is now anyway. It's, right. You and know, he wasn't always that way. And that's a great dynamic for the film is sure. that it's an expose on this dark, seedy underbelly of, I guess, exorcisms. This may be early, but I, I need to talk about one of my favorite moments in the film. And it's early in the film, and I think it sets the tone for the former part of the entire movie, The Last Exorcism. You want to talk about banana bread, don't I you? I want to talk about banana bread. Yeah, sure. So this guy is charismatic. He talks about how he was a child preacher. All preachers need their gimmicks. The Holy Spirit is live and ripe within him. Yeah. And he's out, and he's talking to the documentary crew, and he's talking about how if you get in the zone... They don't even care what you're saying. Sure, sure. They just bow and believe. Something we'll see a lot of later in the movie. Exactly. And so he claims that he could go in there and make a sermon out of his grandmother's banana bread recipe. Sure, yeah. And they make a bet out of it. So he goes in there and, can I get an amen? Can I get a hallelujah? Can I get an amen and a hallelujah? If you take two bananas and an egg and you stir that in a pot and you throw that in the oven for 400 degrees and you take that out after two hours, do you get banana bread? Can I get an amen? And the congregation goes wild. Yeah, nobody even questions it. And it's this moment where you realize that it's 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 almost back to uh, thank you for smoking, right? If you are making the if you make them believe you're right, it doesn't matter your sure. argument. People what get you're caught trying up in to it. say doesn't matter as long as they think you're right. Yeah, that's how magic tricks work. Yeah, that's I mean, how exorcism and works. It's, it's the trust. metaphor for the whole film. Sure. As long as he can keep other people believing that what he's doing is really what he's doing. Sure. It doesn't matter what he does or yeah, the, what he believes. Well, I want to get back around to what he believes because I think that's a, an important point and we glossed over it to jump into magic tricks sure. because magic tricks are fun. Uh -huh. But that's, you know, we're, we're getting to know this guy. First of all, uh, before I forget, we're getting to know this guy because of Eli Roth. Yeah, that's true. The that's only reason that I should come up saw this once, movie is right? because yeah. Eli Roth produced it. Eli Roth produced it. He's been gone from the film world for a while. He hasn't made uh, anything since Hostel 2. Oh, no. The last thing he made was um, Thanksgiving. Nation's Pride. Oh, yeah. Nation's <laughs> Pride. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you and I have talked before about you make Hostel 2. Maybe you don't make anything yeah, after that. I mean, there maybe is always that option. Where you want to where you want to go out. Yeah. But we're just we're hanging on Eli Roth's fucking Twitter account waiting mm -hmm. for him to come out with another movie. And so he's talking about this a lot. He produced it. And man, after years of nonsense ghost hunter stuff on TV, it was so nice to see a documentary sort of turn the tables and do what's honestly a more truthful documentary through fiction sure. than these fucking fake documentary ghost shows are on right. TV. And it's, I guess it's probably a good time and important for us to note that this is a fictional film. Yeah. We've gone for two weeks now <laughs> pretending sure. it's an actual documentary. Yeah, right. And just for the sake of our listenership, we don't think you're stupid. But there are Terry's out there. Yeah, there's definitely Terry's and out there. And this is a fictional film. These are actors. The story's made up. There's no such thing as God, demons, or ghosts. Well, anytime we talk about this found footage, handy cam sort of stuff, sure. we always encounter that. And audiences are getting really wise to it. But, you know, there was that stuff we talked about back uh, during The Fourth Kind, yeah. right? Yeah. Where people still, even then, you know, we had a hard time believing it, but people did walk away thinking there might be some documentary sure. edge to that. This is completely fabricated, 100% fabricated, based on some real ideas, but no real events. Right. It's actually fabricated twice over because the film is fictional, but then the the goings on are fabricated. Well, well, yeah, that's the other thing, too. And eventually we'll get to the end, which just makes it even harder. Yeah. But uh, up to that point, and you know, when I talked earlier about believing some events in one and not in the other, I will believe the events of Exit Through the Gift Shop. This is a fictional movie, and I will choose right. to not believe its events actually took place. But Cotton will choose to believe that... Does he believe in God? He thinks the doctor instead of God. That's enough for me, right. really. I and mean, I that's think, all I need to know about I this guy right now. I think he changes his mind around the time Nell attacks him. Sure. And he sure. kind of... he it's, it's this really awesome moment where he retroactively... He says early on in the film, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in God, you inherently have to believe in the devil. And if you believe in the devil, then you believe in demons and angels. And that's kind of... Those are the rules. Yeah. If you believe in one, you believe in the whole package. Sure. If you don't believe in any, you don't believe in anything. Does that, sure. does that ring true? Yeah. So then he gets in this situation where he does believe Nell is possessed. And so retroactively, he has to rekindle his faith because by his own belief... Believing in any aspect of the Christian Bible, you know, the canon there sure. means you have to believe in all of it, which is 
at least at the very least something I admire in a religious person yeah. that they swallow the whole pill sure. and not just the the better parts of the buffet. Well, we've been talking over and over about Cemetery Junction. What about the ledge? I mean, that sure. was something we discussed yeah, exactly. on there too. Yeah, you uh, you can't buffet Christian it. You fucking read the book and you listen to all of it or none of it. And don't give me any nonsense about how it's a bunch of cute tales. And sometimes allegory, but this is oh real God. and Noah was real, but nothing there about wasn't that really book a is lion. cute. Yeah. Boring sometimes, not cute. <laughs> and always funny, always. Yeah, I mean, I think he uh, he has some struggles with his faith or non-faith. Uh, but, you know, at that end barn scene, he ultimately goes, aha, gotcha. Yeah. You are full of crap. Well, I think that's a really, really freeing moment for him because we see him, they show him through the window, right? Where he's, he's praying, his hands are folded, his sure. head's down. Sure. And it's a really dark moment for me because it feels like he's being forced to believe in something sure, he sure. so strongly doesn't believe yeah. in. It, I mean, it'd be the same thing if you or I came upon what we believed to be evidence of a demon, sure. right? We would have to reevaluate literally every aspect of our belief system. Yeah. And that's what he's doing. He's being forced into accepting something that he fundamentally disagrees with. Sure. And then he ends up in the barn and blowing job. And oh my God, thank <laughs> you. I don't have to believe in you. Sure. Yeah. You lying little girl. Well, and that's uh, really why I don't care about the ending a whole lot, whichever yeah. direction it goes, because. If the movie chooses to set itself in a universe where demons are real, as we've often talked about before, sure. Constantine. Then, yeah, this has been an entire movie about, you know, creating a good skepticism toolkit. Sure. And if you're presented with a fire demon or a devil baby, maybe for you that's the that's the personal line, you having been there and us just being viewers. Where you say, I feel like I have enough definitive proof. Because everybody has that line. Yeah. Unless you just refuse to have an open mind. But if your mind's even a little bit open, there is an, an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence that sure. could change it. So I don't have any disagreements there. Although uh, there is this common cynical idea, and the one I said we glossed over earlier, that you can cure mentally ill people through fake exorcism. Yeah. And so I, one of my favorite things about the movie is that it's a grand example of what could happen in those situations. Right. You know, on, on many different levels. I mean, first, people who lie for a living are incredible at it, justifying it, Yeah, you know, for sure. themselves. Well, I mean, right off the bat, what does she say? You're, it's a hoax or something? And he says, that's your words, not yeah, mine. Yeah, right, right. Well, and he comes up with the, I'm, you know, he is a car salesman yeah. through this entire movie, especially those early parts. Right. And so, you know, he might have a smooth way of convincing himself. It's how he gets to sleep at night, sure. honestly. It's the same thing with psychics. Yeah, I mean, it, to get, again, to go back to Thank You for Smoking, the, Nick Naylor and Cotton Marcus are very similar. Sure. These are characters whose entire livelihood is based on being able to sell not only everyone around them on potentially dangerous ideas, but, but most also importantly sell themselves, themselves yeah. that it's okay. Yeah, you're totally right. And so putting that aside, there's uh, the fact physical harm could come to the people you're exercising. When we did the show on the exorcism of Emily Rose, mm -hmm. that was one of the things we mentioned quite a bit is, especially around when that episode came out, there was just a lot of news happening about, you know, accidental deaths during exorcism right. and all these negative effects, all the uh, what's the harm, Google that, sure. what's the harm website. But the other thing is... As we figure out, he's not a doctor. He right. doesn't know what the fuck illness is. <laughs> and later, he gets in over his head. He winds up in a hospital going, whoa, fuck, I'm not a doctor. Maybe yeah. we should get some tests run. Hey, do you right. think we should get some tests run? Can someone run some tests? The biggest problem, I think, though, is he's treating a symptom, not the problem itself. Sure. This is a person who thinks they're possessed by demons. Now, he thinks, oh, I see a mentally ill person so i'm going to tell them their demons are gone and fix their problem that's yeah. a very how to solve you know ghosts in a five-year-old's room way yeah of i mean with it's it. it's trying to treat a mental problem with the placebo effect and yeah. let's be honest that doesn't usually work mental problems tend to be a lot more complex yeah and sure deep yeah. than a stomach ache before your first day of school right yeah yeah you know, telling your kid there aren't monsters under the bed is not going to have as lasting an impact as going under the bed and seeing there aren't any fucking monsters. You know, you change the belief system. If it's not grounded in reality, if we just say, oh, I've exercised the demons, now they're gone. All right, <laughs> thanks for the money and I'll see you. 
that leaves them with a false impression of the world, of how things actually work. And without correcting that system of logic, they could make the same mistake again. In fact, they do in the movie. Right. They need a second exorcism, right? Uh, They even make the UFO joke when they're going into town. Yeah. You know, so maybe you stop believing in exorcisms, but hey, guess what? Then UFOs are coming in and invading your, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's always going to be some other boogeyman unless you say, you know what? Rather than just telling you there's no more demons, let me give you a system of tests that you can run yourself. Let me give you some Carl Sagan books to hold on to. And you know what? You too can do this at home. Right. Let's get to the bottom of why you did what you did to the cat. (laughs) The fucking cat. (laughs) That first person cat beating is amazing. (laughs) Well, there's the the snap on the neck and then the nudity and the, you know, she gets out there and just the sound of the cat, how fast and aggressive it just happens. All of a sudden, you know, it's winding up and then it just fucking happens. And that kind of breathing, laughing sort of sound as she's pummeling the thing to death. If none of this talky making fun of Jesus is working out for you, watch it for some cat deaths. Yeah, that's true. Or creepy motel rooms. Yeah, we get a lot of those on the show, don't, I don't we? Know, there's a slew. I don't know if it's a recent film phenomenon. But Not a lot of happy places. Motel rooms in films are just where you go to have creepy things happen. We saw it in Joyride. Yeah. Saw it in The Devil's Rejects. It's in Monster Man. That's the difference between a hotel and a motel, yeah. I believe. See, a hotel is where the girlfriend experience takes place. Sure. And a motel is where the devil's rejects happens. <laughs> Fucking motel. Wood, cat. Um, oh, yeah. So we were talking about the exorcisms. And, uh, you know, you, you see those things break down mm-hmm. after the first exorcism. Uh, it, everything goes according to his plan. And as soon as there's a wrench thrown in it, you see why suddenly, not to keep going back to the ledge, but I think that was the show where we talked about just fucking tell the truth and things mm-hmm. won't snowball out of control. He's not prepared for all these things. And so now he's in a position where, you know, he needs to have very real conversations about real life with that girl's father medical conversations right you know uh then about the pregnancy and her dad has been so sold on exorcisms he just won't get off the fucking exorcism kick and she really needs to seek some kind of attention and it it just makes things worse you know it gets to the point where um the film crew reminds him that he's the one who said death is the only salvation you fucking told him that and his only hope at this point is to try and convince him otherwise if the truth had been on his side, they could all be working towards the same ends and speaking the same fucking language. But the fact that he sells them on a lie, he doesn't have a support system to back that up. Yeah. If he had used the truth to begin with, then he could simply say, all right, testable hypothesis. If this is how this operates, then why don't we try these three things and sure. see if they fall in line with the system we had already set up? He can't do that. Now he's just fucked because right. he told a huge lie. Exactly. This is what happens when the ends justify the means. Well, and another big ends justify the means, but this is one I root for only because of its ingenuity. Now I'm curious what you're about to say. Is uh, his gadgets. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't root for it. You know what I mean? I don't root for You it. like magic tricks. I think they're- Who doesn't like it, magic tricks? I just think it's so smart. Yeah. The stupid little things he comes up with in order to- create this reality the little shock rings and can we the, call them the pop-offs of yeah. his uh yeah. his batman <laughs> utility belt yeah it's it's amazing how it goes back to the banana bread it's amazing how convincing those theatrics are the mood sells that more than anything that's why the fuck horror films work yeah because it's you true. set up a mood that was the house of the devil yeah. you set a fucking mood and you just let people sweat in it and at that point we're willing to believe whatever the fuck he's selling because he set that mood the film throws a little score in there, even though it's a found footage thing. <laughs> but that's it's making the point, too. It's saying, sure. hey, look at this mood we're using to uh, drive things home. And that absolutely makes that point. It sure. helps make that point, definitely. It lets your mind do the work. It haunts you. All the time, we'll talk about uh, you know, Penn & Teller's bullshit mm-hmm. being a great show for skepticism. But I think uh, you know that other show they did, Fool Us, yeah. uh, before they started doing the Discovery stuff, was another good example just in showing people magic acts and showing one that Penn and Teller, who have been doing this for decades, they know the they know the ropes. But two, they can be fooled. Yeah. Otherwise, the show would be sure. impossible. So they can use skepticism. They know all of the things are tricks going in. That's yeah. what skepticism tells them. But they don't always know how it's done. So other things you learn from that right away is one: you don't necessarily have to know how it's done to know that it's not reality. 
But two, other people can be fooled. Masters of the craft can be fooled. Our fucking reverend can be fooled. Yeah. And most of all, his marks uh, can be fooled. And I think by watching something like Fool Us, you get a better sense of how magic tricks are performed. You start to see, they show all these magic acts. Did you see all of Fool Us or was that kind of spotty for you? No, I just saw the first couple episodes, yeah. What's great is by the end of that show, you've seen a lot of different routines perform similar enough tricks that you sort of know the methods from previous uh, kind uh-huh. of exposés that they did on the show, but you just see a different packaging. And as I'm watching this, I'm remembering back to Fool Us. I'm remembering, oh, these particular magicians did those same fucking tricks. That's why you see so many magicians mm-hmm. in skepticism. Right. Same tricks, but with a religious packaging right. to them. In that way, too, I think the movie's kind of fighting itself. It has this battle, this this work cut out for it that it's trying to tell you, all right, story says this stuff doesn't exist and these things aren't actually creepy. They're real. They have explanations. The nickel is what's chafing her skin. Sure. You know, this isn't demonic possession. And then at the same time, the movie's a horror film trying to be scary. Sure. And so that's another great credit I have to to give it is that it's using the theatrics that it's telling you about, the stuff like the music I mentioned, to sell a story that on paper it's telling you is not a real fucking story, that these things right. could not happen, and here's why you should not be afraid of them. And somehow, it's still creepy. The girl's still creepy. Yeah. The scenes of her running around being sure. pseudo-fucking-whatever-possessed are creepy. I mean, you get scare shots, but the movie holds up plenty of natural things for right. people to still be afraid of. Right. Crazy, psychotic girl is still a thing to be yep. afraid of gun-toting dad who may be raping his daughter still a thing to be scared of right so if we could hit on the ending briefly then do you think you can reconcile this naturally i don't and i have a different bent unless you want to try to reconcile it naturally yeah you know i love to make that mental exercise i've done it several times before on the show and i usually need you to bring me back into yeah. film world and go come on dummy that's not what the film yeah. is trying to do here like i said before i don't think there's any point debating because it's i you know here's the thing we get a little spiky baby, but it might be an incestuous baby. I don't know. That's kind of my excuse <laughs> Incest there. Incest does breed spikes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's not true, but I don't want to be in denial, but the movie has built me some sort of toolkit and I really want to use the tools it's given. But yeah, I mean, really, I'm going to stay pretty strong to my previous point about not really debating it because what this ending is, it, let's tear away the part where we're pretending along with the film. It's a purposefully climactic and ambiguous while edgy ending that's exactly how they wrote it they did that on purpose they don't want us to know they want us to talk about it so here we are and they win you know what this film does Hmm. we fall prey to the banana bread yeah (laughs) cotton is so charismatic and he's so there are no demons come on let's be serious look at all this magic that i do by myself that we just forget that there is a possibility that he's wrong. Yeah. We're just on his side because we think he's a great guy. Yeah. We think he's a charismatic preacher. Sure. The fact of the matter is reality doesn't have to be charismatic. Yeah. Reality gets all its strength from evidence. Mm-hmm. And in this film, the reality of the situation is Cotton's fucking wrong. Yeah. And as charismatic as he is, as charismatic as we've seen him be, you can't out charisma reality. It sits weird because we've been on the side of what we believe to be reality. But I think the whole time we've been under the spell of this boy preacher who's sure. been groomed to mislead us yeah. the entire time. It's showing us that even ourselves, we can have the rug pulled out from sure. under us. That's kind of what I was alluding to a little bit when I was talking about when you get that overwhelming amount of evidence. Sure. You know, we do have to be open to the fact that maybe this is a world with demons. It's not trying to convince us that our own world is a world with demons. That's why it's a fucking fictional movie. But when we see something like that at the end, are we open enough minded in the same way that, you know, he might have tried to convince everybody else to be that there, you know, there are demons or he was putting on a sham this whole time. Can we change our minds the way he might when presented? Yeah. When presented with that evidence. You can go on the website now in the next several seconds and actually find out what movies we're doing next time without waiting for us to get around to the part where we actually fucking name the movies. Well, we've had requests for both of these films on our Facebook, which we actually do look at. Yeah. That's why everything that gets put, literally every fucking thing that any of Podmanity posts gets a little like. Yeah. Because that's basically us marking. We pay attention. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing Chillerama. 
which is uh, four of our, our personal favorite directors, and then a fifth personal favorite director with Super. Okay, yeah. So we can just pretend we weren't going to do those movies anyways right. and that we were just listening to people yeah, on the that's Facebook. that's what we'll say. Yeah. I also love that you use like as the mark as red button. Uh-huh. You're really coming along with this technology. Watch more fucking film. Bye.